from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Nobody Ever Goes There by Manly Wade Wellman. That was what Mark Banyan's grandparents told him when he was a five-year-old with tousled black hair, looking from the porch and out across Catch River to a big dark building and some small dark ones clumped against the soaring face of Music Mountain, rank with its gloomy huddle of trees. His grandparents towered high to tell him the way grown-ups do when you're little and they said, Nobody ever goes there. Without explaining the way grown-ups do when you're little. Mark was a good obedient boy. He didn't press the matter, and he sure enough didn't go over. The town had been named Trimble for somebody who a hundred years and ago had a stock stand there. Entertainment for man and beast. In those old days, stagecoaches and trading wagons rolled along the road chopped through the mountains and sometimes came great herds of cattle and horses and hogs. Later there had been the railroad that carried hardly anything anymore. Trucks rumbled along Main Street and on northwest to Tennessee or southeast to Asheville. Trimble was no great size for a town. Maybe that was why it stayed interesting to look at. It had stores on Main Street and Mark's grandfather's chair factory the town hall, and the weekly record. On side streets stood the bank, the high school where students came by bus from all corners of the Rocky County, and three churches. All those things were on this side of Catch River. But over yonder, where nobody went, loomed the empty-windowed old textile mill, like the picture of a ruined castle in an outlawed romantic novel. Once it had spun its acres of cloth, People working there had lived in a little house you could barely see from this side. Those houses had a dusky secret look, bunched against Music Mountain. When Mark asked why it was called Music Mountain, his grandparents said, We never heard tell why. So once in his bed at night, Mark thought he heard soft music from across Catch River to his window. When he mentioned the next day, they laughed and said he was making it up. He stopped talking about that other side of the river, but he kept his curiosity as he grew older. He found out a few things from listening to people when he played in town. He found out that a police car did cruise over there two or three times a week on the rattly old bridge that nobody else used, and that the cruise was made only by daylight. When he was in high school, tall and tanned, in a hot rock tight end on the football team, he and two classmates started to amble across one Saturday. They were nearly halfway to the other side when a policeman came puffing after them and scolded them back. That night, Mark's grandparents told them never to let them hear of doing such a fool thing again. He asked why it was foolish, and his grandmother said, Nobody ever goes there, ever, and shut up her mouth with a snap. One who did tell Mark something about it was Mr. Glover Shelton, the oldest man in Trimble, who whittled birds and bear cubs and rabbits in his little shop behind the Worley Cafe. Once a month he sold a crate of such whittlings to a man who carried them to a tourist bazaar off in another county. Mr. Glover was lamed so that he had an elbow in one knee like a cricket. He wore check shirts and bib overalls, and a pointed beard as white as dandelion fluff, and he had memories. Something other happened there around about 75 years back, he said. I was another sight younger than you then. There was a textile mill and 34 folks living in them company houses and a working two shifts. Then one day, they was all of a sudden all gone. Gone where? 
Mark asked him. Don't rightly know how to answer that. Just gone. Durwood Niger, the manager, and Sam Brood, the foreman, and the whole crew on shift, gone. Mr. Glover whittled at the blue jay he was making. One night, just around sundown, the whistle had blowed and blowed, and folks over here got curiosity up, and next day some of them headed over across the bridge, and ne'er soul at the mill, nor neither yet in the houses, the wives and children done gone too, everybody. Are you putting me on, Mr. Glover? You done asked me, boy, and I done told you the thing I recollect about it. They just packed up and left? They left, but they sure got near packed up. The looms was still a-running. Durwood Niger's $50 hat was on the hook. His cigar burnt out in the tray on his desk. Even supper standing on the stoves, two, three places, but ne'er sold to be seen anywheres. Mark looked to see if a grin was caught in the white beard, but Mr. Glover was as solemn as a preacher. Where did they go? Mark asked. I just wish you'd tell me. There was a search made, inquiries here and yonder. But none of them folks e'er showed themselves again. And now, said Mark, nobody ever goes there? Well, now, couple three had gone, one time another, from here and a hunter on a cooning over Music Mountain from the far side. But none e'er come back no more. Only them policemen that drives over quick and comes back quick. Always by daylight. Always three in the car with pistols and sawed-off shotguns. Boy, said Mr. Glower, folks just stays off from that there place. Like a staying off from a rocket patch full of snakes. A wet bottom full of chills and fever. And now it's a habit, said Mark, staying out. Likewise a habit not to go a-talking about it, none. Don't you go a-naming it to nobody. I told you this much. Mark played good enough football to get a grant and aid at a lowland college, about enough help to make the difference between going and not going. Summers, he mostly worked hard to keep in condition, in construction, and at road mending. By the time he graduated, his grandparents had sold a chair factory and had retired to Florida. Mark came back to Trimble, where they hired him to coach football and baseball and teach physical education at his old high school. And still, nobody ever went across Catch River. He felt the old interest, but he quickly became more interested in Ruth Koval, the history teacher. She was small and slim, and her hair was blonde with a spice of red to it. She wore it more or less the length Mark wore his own black mane. She came up to about his coat lapel. Her face was round and sweet. She gave him a date but wanted to sit and talk on the porch of the teacherage instead of driving out to an outdoor movie. It was a balmy October night. She fetched them out two glasses of iced tea, flavored with lemon juice and ginger. They sat on bark bottom chairs, and Ruth said it was good to be in Trimble. I've liked it here from the first, she said. I've thought I might write a history of this town. A history of Trimble? Mark repeated, smiling. Who'd read that? You might, when I finish it. This place has stories worth putting on record. I've been to the town hall and the churches. I found out lots of interesting things, but one thing avoids me. What's that, Ruth? Mark asked, sipping. Why nobody ever goes across the river, and why everybody changes the subject when I bring it up. From where they sat, they could see a spattery shimmer of moonlight on the water, but Music Mountain beyond was as black as soot. Ruth Mark said, You're up against a story that just never is told in Trimble. But why not? Her face hung silvery in the moon glow. I don't know. I never found out. And I was born here. Old Mr. Glover Shelton told me a few things. But he's dead now. He related the old man's story. I'm unable to tell you why things are that was about the business he wound up. It's just not discussed. Sort of the way sex didn't used to be discussed in polite society. I suspect that most people have more or less forgotten about it pushed it to the back of their minds. But the police go over, she reminded them. The chief said it was just a routine check, a tour in a deserted area. Then he changed the subject, too. If I were you, 
I'd not push anyone too hard about all this, said Mark. It's a sort of rule of life here, staying on this side of the river. As an athletic coach, I abide by rules. As a historian, I look for the truth, she said back, and I don't like to have the truth denied me. He changed the subject. They talked cheerfully of other things. When he left that night, she let him kiss her and said he could come back and see her again. Next Saturday evening, Ruth finished grading a sheaf of papers, and just before sundown, she walked out in the town with Mark. She wore snug jeans and a short, dark jacket. They had a soda at Doc Roberts' drugstore and strolled on along Main Street. Mark told her about his boyhood in Trimble, pointed out the massive old town hall, twice burnt down, once by accident, and rebuilt both times inside its solid brick walls, and led her behind Worley's Cafe to show her where Glover Shelton once had worked. The door of the little old shop was open. A light gleamed through it, and a voice from inside said, Heidi. A man sat at the ancient workbench, dressed in a blue hickory shirt and khaki pants and plow shoes, carefully shaping a slip of wood with a bright sharp knife. He was lean and as tall as Mark, say six feet. His long, thoughtful face was neither young nor old, and his dark hair showed silver dabs at the temples and in a brushed back lock on top. Glover Shelton and I were choice friends years back, he said. I need a special kind of woods he hunted out and used here. And his nephew loaned me a key so I could come to work me out a new bridge for my old guitar. It was an old guitar indeed, seasoned as dark brown as a nut. The man set the new bridge in place with a dab of some adhesive compound. That'll dry right while we're studying it, he said. Then he laid the strings across threaded them through the pegs and tightened them with judicious fingers. He struck a cord, adjusted the pegs, struck and struck again. Sounds passable, he decided. Those strings shine like silver, offered Ruth. Just so happened that silver's what they are, was the reply, with a quiet smile. Silver's what the oldest old-timers used. Mike could be, I'm the last that uses it. He achieved a chord to suit him. Tunefully, richly, he sang. She came down the stair, combing back her yellow hair, and her cheek was as red as the rose. Mark had made up his mind to do something. Sir, he said, I knew Mr. Glover Shelton when I was a boy. This young lady wishes he had lived for her to talk to, because he was the only man I ever spoke to that knew of the far side of the Ketch River yonder. The music mountainside. I know a tad of something about that, said the guitar picker, while the strings whispered under his long, skilled fingers. An old Indian medicine man named of Reuben Manco. He mentioned about it to me one time. Nobody here in Trimble talks about it, said Mark. They just stay away from over there. Nobody ever goes there. I reckon not, son. The way Reuben Manco had it, the old Indians more or less left the place alone too. What was there didn't relish to be pestered. Some other kind of men than Indians, suggested Ruth. Better just only call them things. The way the old history comes down, they didn't actually look like a man could tell of at first, and they more or less learnt from us studying men, Indians, how to get a little bitty bit like men too. They sound weird, said Mark, interested. I reckon that's a good word for them. The Indians were scared of how they made themselves to look. So sometimes the Indians got up on top of the mountains yonder and sang to the things to make sure they wouldn't try to come out and make trouble. The long, thoughtful face brooded above the guitar's soft melody. I reckon that's how it comes to be named Music Mountain. The Indians would sing those things back off and into their place, time after time, I reckon all the way up to when the white man came in. Came in and took the Indians' land, said Mark. That happened here. Shh, it happened all over America. The taking of the land. All right, I've given you what Reuben Manco gave me. 
Music Mountain for the music the Indians used against those things. Why won't anybody in town tell me about this? Ruth asked. I don't reckon folks in town much heard of it, especially when they might not want to hear tell of it. I'm glad to hear it, declared Ruth. I'm someone who wants to know things. There's always a right much to get to know, ma'am, was the polite rejoinder. Mark sat down on the workbench. Music, he repeated. Could the Indians control something like that? Something frightening, you said, with music? Well, son, with Indians, the right song can make the rain to fall. An Indian hunter sings to bring him luck before he goes after game. Medicine sing to cure a sick man or a hurt man. One time or another, music's been known to do the like of such things. Mark asked for the story of the mill that had been built under Music Mountain. It seemed that Durwood Niger had interested some northern financiers and had built his mill, with Trimble's townspeople shaking their heads about it. But there was good pay, and families came from other places to live in the houses built for them and to spin the cloth until the night they all vanished. What if there had been music at the mill, Mark wondered, in the houses? Doesn't seem like as if there was much of that, so we can't rightly tell, and it's too late to figure out it now. The sun sank over the western mountains. Dusk slid swiftly down into the town. Mark listened as his companion struck the silver strings and sang again. She came down the stair, combing back her yellow hair. He muted the melody with his palm. Sounds like that beauty-looking young girl that came here with you. Where's she gone off to? Mark jumped up from where he sat. Ruth was nowhere in sight. He hurried out of the shop, around the cafe, and out into the street. Ruth, wait! Far along the sidewalk, in the light of a shop window, he saw her as she turned off and out of view, where the old alley led to where the bridge was. Wait, he yelled after her and started to run. It was a long sprint to the alley. One or two loungers gazed at Mark as he raced past. He found the alley, headed into it, stumbled in its darkness, and went to one knee. He felt his trousers rip where they struck the jagged old cobbles. Up again he hurried to the bridge. It was already too dim to see clearly, but Ruth must be there. She must be moving along almost as fast as he. You damn fool, he wheezed into the darkening air as he ran. You damn little fool, why did you do this? And in his heart, her voice seemed to answer him. I'm someone who wants to know things. The old, old boards of the bridge rattled under his feet. He heard the soft, purling rush of Catch River. There she was now, at the far end, a darker point in the night that came down on them. Ruth, he tried to call her once, but his breath wasn't enough to carry it. He ran on after her. Now he had come out on the other bank, where nobody ever went. He turned to his left. A road of sorts had been there once, it seemed. Its blotchy stones were ranked between with grass. His shoe skid on what must have been slippery moss, and he nearly went down again. To his right climbed the steep face of Music Mountain huddled with watching trees as black as ink. On ahead of him, small dark houses clung together at the roadside. Further beyond them rose the sooty pile of the old mill. He stood for a moment and wheezed to get his breath. Something came toward him. He quivered as he faced it. I knew you'd come to Mark, said Ruth's merry voice. At that moment, the moon had scrambled clear of the mountain and flung pale light around them. He saw that Ruth smiled. Why ever did you, he began to say. I told you, Mark, I want to find things out. Nobody else here wants to, dares to. You come right back to town with me, he commanded. She laughed musically. On into the sky swam the round, pallid moon, among a bright sprinkling of stars. Its light picked out the mill more clearly. It stuck a twinkle from the glass of a window. Or could there be a stealthy light inside? Ruth laughed again. But you came across at least, she said, as though happy about it. 
The glow of the moon beat upon her, making her hair pale, and something else moved on the road to the mill. He hurried toward Ruth as the something drifted from between those dubious houses, a murky series of puffs, like foul smoke. He thought for a moment, hoped that it might be fog, but it gathered into shapes as it emerged, shadowy, knobby shapes, head-like lumps seemed to rise, narrow at the top, with, Mark thought, great loose mouths, whiffs stirred like groping arms. Let's get out of here, he said to Ruth, and tried to catch her by the hand. But then she too saw those half-shaped things that now stole into groups and advanced. She screamed once like an animal caught in a trap, and she lost her head and ran from them. She ran toward the mill in the moonlight that flooded the old paving stones. Mark rushed after her because he must, because he had to be caught and hustled back towards the bridge. As the two of them fled, the creatures from among the houses slunk, stole after them, made a line across the road, cut off escape in that direction. Ruth ran fast in her unreasoning terror toward where a great squat doorway gaped in the old mill. But then she stopped, so suddenly that Mark nearly blundered against her as he hurried from behind. More, she whimpered, more of them. And more of them crept out through the door. Many more of them crowding together into a grotesque phalanx. Ruth pressed close against Mark. She trembled, sagged. Her pert daring was gone from her. He gathered his football muscles for fight, whatever fight he could put up. They came closing in around them and Ruth, those shapes that were only half shapes. They churned wispily as they formed themselves into a ring. He made out squat bodies, knobs of craniums, the green gleam of eyes. Not all of the eyes set two and two. The Indians, those odd Indians, had been right to fear presences like these. Everything drew near. Above the encircling approaching horde, Mark saw things that fluttered in the air. Bats? But bats are never that big. He heard a soft mutter of sound, as of panting breath. Even if Ruth hadn't been there to hold on her feet, Mark could never have run now. The way was cut off. It would have to be a battle. What kind of battle? Just then, abrupt music rang out in the shining night. And that was a brave music, a flooding burst of melody, like harps in the hands of minstrels. A powerful, tuneful voice sang words to it. The cross is my right hand, that I may travel open land, that I may be charmed and blessed and safe from any man or beast. The pressing throng ceased to press around Mark and Ruth. It ebbed away like dark water flowing back from an island. The song changed, the guitar and the voice changed. Lights in the valley outshine the sun, lights in the valley outshine the sun. Lights in the valley outshine the sun. Look away beyond the blue. Those creatures, if they could be called creatures, fell back. They fell back as though blown by the wind. The singing voice put in words of its own, put in a message of guidance. Head for the bridge and I'll follow you. Head for the bridge and I'll follow you. Head for the bridge and I'll follow you. Look away beyond the blue. Ruth would have run again. Mark held her tightly by the arm kept her to a walk. Running just now might start something else running. They stumbled back along the rough stones with the grass between the edges. The moonlight blazed upon them. Behind them like a prayer, another verse of the song. Do, Lord, O oh do, Lord, O oh do, remember me. Do, Lord, O oh do, Lord, O oh do, remember me. Do, Lord, O oh do, Lord, O oh do, remember me. Look away beyond the blue but this time a confident happiness in that appeal. Mark felt like joining in and singing the song himself, but he kept silent and urged Ruth along by her arm. He thought, though he could not be sure, that soft radiances blinked on and off in the shanty-like old houses strung along the road. He did not stop to look more closely. He peered ahead for the bridge, and then the bridge was there and thankfully they were upon it. 
their feet drumming the planks. Still he panted for breath as they reached the other side. He held Ruth to him, glad that he could hold her, glad for her that he was there to hold her. He looked across. There on the bridge came something dark. It was the guitar picker, moving at a slower pace than Mark and Ruth had moved. He sang softly now, softly. Mark could not make out the song. He came and joined them at last. He stood tall and lean with his hair rumpled, holding his guitar across him like a rifle at the port. You all can be easy now, he said gently. Look yonder. They can't come over this far. Over there, all the way over there, at the far bridge ahead, a dark cluster of forms showed under the moon, standing close together and not coming. The fact about it is, said the guitar picker, they don't seem to be up to making their way across a run of water. Mark was able to speak. Like Dracula, he said numbly. Like the witches in Tam O'Shanter. Sure enough, like them. Now, folks, and the voice was gentler than ever. You all see they'd best be left alone on their side yonder. The way folks have mostly left them alone. All the way back to when the whole crew of the mill went off to nowhere. Old ways can be best. Mark, I was such a fool. Ruth mumbled against Mark's shirt. I told you that, dear, he said to her. Did you call me dear? Yes. It makes me feel right good to hear talk about that with nice young folks like you two, said the guitar picker. Mark looked up above Ruth's trembly golden head. You were able to defeat them, he said. You knew music would hold them back. No, I ne'er rightly knew that. The big hands swept the melody from the silver string. I hoped it was all, and the hope wasn't vain. Mark held out a shaking hand. We'll never be able to thank you, Mr. I don't even know your name. My name is John. John what? Mark asked. Just call me John.